Welcome to today's central exercise session. As usual, we'd be happy to take your questions on our chat channel. The chat is available online on chat.tum.de. And please use this channel here, MA9711-CE, to post your questions. We'll be discussing sheet number nine today. And the question, uh, the questions, as usual, will be moderated. And today's moderator is once again, Lissery Fernandez. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so we will do it as always we have them. So you write your questions in the chat, and then I will collect them and ask whenever there is time for that. Thank you. Okay, so let's start right away with uh, sheet number nine. So as you can see, sheet number nine is mainly about sequences and series. So um, we've finished with the linear algebra part of this lecture and we've started the analysis part. And the first topic of that is sequences and series um, uh, and their convergence properties. And later on, we extend that to convergence of functions. That's basically this week's topics if you have started watching the videos already. And of course, the ultimate goal is uh, to talk about differentiation and later integration of functions as well. But let's start at the beginning and the beginning of analysis usually is sequences and their properties. So uh, we commence with uh, C91. There's um, three different sequences in C91. And the goal is to determine the limit if possible or to determine that the sequences are not convergent. Of course, that's also a possibility. So let's start with uh, point A. So the first sequence, AN, is defined as a fraction. The numerator is 4n to the third power minus n plus 2 to the third power divided by 2n plus 1 to the third minus 8. And if we want to determine the limit of a fraction like this, what we usually do is we try to divide both numerator and denominator by the highest power that is available in one of those. And in this case, um, if you have a look here, you can see the power here, the we have an n to the power of three. Here we have an expression involving an n to the power of three. So that would also yield a polynomial of degree three. So that means the highest power in the numerator is three. And the same is true for the denominator. Here we have two n. So this expression here will uh, get us a polynomial of degree three once again. So the idea is to divide by the highest power of n. Um, and the objective of that is basically to filter out the parts that are not really interesting um, for the limit, if there is a limit of that sequence and to only keep the parts um, that will more or less dictate the behavior of the sequence for large values of n. So, what we'll do here is, let me just copy this. Oops. Okay, what we do is we'll divide by the highest power of n, meaning we'll multiply each uh, numerator and denominator by one over n to the third. Of course, that operation here, that would just cancel out. So that's like multiplying by one meaning we can't just do that. Okay, what happens here is, um, of course, if you have a sum or a difference in uh, the numerator like here, then you have to divide each of those summons by n to the third. So in this case, we get, let me just write that out, four n to the third divided by n to the third, minus, and here we have n plus two to the third, divided by n to the third. Um, and of course, hopefully anticipating one of your questions, you don't have to do it 
um, in that detailed fashion every time. I'm just trying to demonstrate how that works one time, and I'm going to abbreviate that a little in the future. But it should still be clear what you're doing. So um, if it's not clear that you're dividing by something like this, and just write down what you intend to do somewhere so that the corrector can know that you know what you're doing, that uh, the corrector gets a justification. And uh, this is even more important in case you get something wrong so that maybe at least for the right approach, you can be given a point. Okay, sorry for interruption, let's continue. So uh, for the denominator, we do the same thing. We again divide everything by n to the power of three. And in this case, we get this expression here. So let's try to simplify that a little. Of course, here, the n to the three just cancels out. So we're left with four. In this case, we can simplify that to n plus two over n and take all of that to the third power. And we can do the same in the denominator here. So here we have two n plus one over n to the third power um, and well, eight over n to the three, we just copy that expression. What we get then is four minus and this here, this, uh, if we split that up, that becomes one plus two over n to the third power. And in the denominator, we get two plus one over n the third power minus eight over n to the third. So um, if we now go ahead and let n go to infinity, um, we just have a look at what happens to the individual parts of that expression here. And basically we only have an n left here in the two over n. Now if n goes to infinity, then of course that will go to zero. There is another n left here, so one over n. If we let n go to infinity, then this will also go to zero. And of course, if n goes to infinity, then n to the third also goes to infinity. So eight over n to the third will also go to zero. And that means we're left with uh, this four here, this one to the power of three, and this two to the power of three. So what we get is uh, for n to infinity, this all tends to four plus, sorry, minus one to the power of three over two to the power of three. And uh, this of course is three over eight. So three over eight is the limit here. So um, already any questions? Uh, yeah, but there are mainly like very general questions. So for instance, the first question was from when on does the lecture content no longer refer to the exam? Uh, there is no such point. Everything we discuss in the lecture is relevant for the exam. Will we get new videos each week until the exam or will we have a week or weeks without no vid new videos? Unfortunately, no. Seeing that the semester is is shorter by by two weeks than it should be, it used to be, um, but the content did not really change. Uh, I will need that last week. I did leave out quite some amount of topics already, uh, mostly details that I think are not that relevant, but I cannot really afford to forgo one more week. Um, then there is a question that it says, um, are there any good tips on how to approach a problem such as justify your answer? Is this series convergent or divergent? Which test should mm -hmm. we go for? We'll talk about series in, in the a later question. So maybe we can defer that question until then. Okay, perfect. Um, wait a second. Then there is another question that it says, um, wait a second. Uh, I have a general question regarding the formula for the geometric sum because in the lecture 64, it was defined as q to the power. Well, maybe this one, I'll, I'll try my best because I think it's easier to answer than to read it. Yeah. Okay, okay then there is another question 
related to this exercise, um, would it be n plus two divided by n, not one plus two divided by n? Uh, no, it's one plus two divided by n, like four, right? You're referring to this expression here, I'm guessing, so this here? Yeah, I guess it's this one, but it's one plus two over n. Yeah. So okay. what you do is you have this sum here and each of those summons is divided by n. So you get n over n plus two over n. So n over n is one. So that leaves us with one plus two over n. So maybe that's it's not that clear. That should be a two here, just in case you misread that. Yeah, then there is, how do you know that the n is not negative and then it changes the infinity to minus infinity? So the n, we're only interested in the limit, meaning the limit, if n tends to infinity plus infinity, um, that's always the assumption in talking about sequences. The n tends to plus infinity, plus if we're talking about sequences, um, then a sequence by definition is a mapping from n or n zero to the real numbers. Um, so our n will always be a natural number so it's never going to be negative. Plus, if it helps, as I said, we're only interested in the limit, so we can assume that n is as large as we need it to be. Um, now, so uh, when will the video in the week prior to the exam be discussed? When will the video be discussed? I don't get that question. Which video? Like the video in the week prior to the exam. Oh, so I mean the topics that we do in the, uh, so uh, the last videos will be published on uh, the last Monday of the semester, which is, I don't really know which date that is. 8th of February. 8th of February, that could be, uh, so around that at least. Um, and of course there'll be an exercise sheet for that. Uh, that's mainly intended for self-study. Um, I'll try and record a video for some of the questions on that sheet so that you have kind of a central exercise session. Uh, for questions, of course, we'll still have a tutorial in that week, um, and there'll also be Q&As in that week. So if you have any questions, um, I'd have to refer you to those. When do we have to apply the epsilon method, and when do we have to test if a sequence is monotone or bounded? So for sequences, um, basically, this monotone or bounded is something that you would apply if nothing else works in many cases. So if you can compute a limit, then you always do that, of course. Uh, that, that gives you the information that the sequence converges and also the limit. Um, for series, there are a couple of other criteria that you can use. If nothing of that seems to work, then you can try and apply the monotone and bounded criterion. So you have to show that a sequence is monotone and bounded, and then you know it converges. You don't know anything about the limit at that point. So basically, I would do that if, if there's no obvious other way. I would try that. Um, one situation where it, where it um, is sometimes very helpful is if you have a sequence that is defined in a recursive way. So for example, like uh, the Fibonacci sequence, which is not bounded, of course, but that would be a recursive definition. Um, you just set the first or maybe the first two elements explicitly. And then you have a definition that says, well, the n plus first element is, I don't know, the, uh, the nth element plus three or whatever. So in that case, it's sometimes easy, if it is the case, um, to prove that a sequence is monotone and bounded. Uh, one possible way to do that would be mathematical induction. That kind of uses this recursion formula. So that might be useful in a setting like this. In many cases, it will not be necessary to apply that. But as I said, if nothing else seems to work, I'd have a look at that. And of course, um, to add to the confusion, uh, a sequence is convergent if it is monotone and bounded, but not necessarily the other way around. So not every convergent sequence is monotone. Um, why you choose n to the power of three as highest n with power? So in this case, the highest power is n to the three because we have an n to the three here. We have a polynomial of degree three here. So 
obviously the power cannot be higher in the numerator and neither can it be in the denominator. Same thing here, we have polynomial of degree three here and no n appears here. So obviously n to the third is the highest power in this case. Um, why does one plus two over n uh, to the power of three tend to zero? Well, it doesn't tend to zero, it tends to one. Yeah, right, it doesn't. So what tends to zero is this part here. And I was only referring to this part. I mean, let me make this more clear. So this here tends to zero. Same thing here, this one over n, two over n, those tend to zero. Um, this part here stays, yeah? You can see that one here and the two here. Um, how do we know that we simplified enough to get the limit? Once you get a decent result, you simplified it enough. Yeah, I don't think there is a better answer. <laughs> yeah. You can think uh, of one. Okay, then does the sequence need to be bounded from above and below? Uh, if it is convergent, then a sequence will be bounded, yes, from above and below. If it's not convergent, of course, anything can happen and it doesn't have to be bounded. So basically the idea is if a sequence is convergent, then from some point on, all the sequence elements will be close to the limit. And of course, then it's bounded by the limit plus or minus of a little epsilon. And all the elements before that, that, that's a finite number of elements. So you can just take the highest and the lowest of that and compare it to the bound given by the limit plus minus epsilon um, and take the highest and lowest of those. So that means every convergent sequence will be bounded. For non-convergent sequences, as I said, anything can happen. Okay, so then there is another question that it says, would just the last step be enough to document the approach to solving the exercise? Um, uh, almost. So if, if that was an exam question, let's say I, I would like to see, of course, the problem statement itself then I divide those by n to the power of three. And if you're good at doing this, then you might arrive at that right away. And then of course, you'd have to somehow denote the uh, convergence of parts of so this, this, and this should be there somewhere. Um, and then this result and the final limit. So these things I'd say would be sufficient in an exam. I just uh, added two more steps in the middle to clarify what I'm doing. Um, if we can't compute a limit or if it is infinity, is the sequence necessarily di uh, divergent? If the limit is infinity, then it's a divergent sequence, yes. So we only speak of convergent sequences if we have a finite limit. Um, if you can't compute a limit, then that can mean all, all sorts of things. Uh, if there is no limit, then it is divergent. If you can't compute one, that could, I mean, I don't really know what you what you mean here. I could just mean that your method doesn't work, but may, there may still be a limit. Yeah, so now maybe the last two questions, what do we do if the denominator and nominator have a different power? In that case, you always take the highest power, always divide by the highest power of n and then see what happens. And probably one of those will go to zero. And depending on whether it's the numerator or the denominator, you will end up with um, either zero as a limit or maybe plus or minus infinity or no limit at all. Okay, and last question is, will we have to use the epsilon method at some point? I will not exclude that explicitly. So possibly yes. Not in most of the examples that are on those sheets, but possibly you'll have to use the epsilon method. So you should know about that. So let's go on with part B then. So for B, we have the sequence Bn defined as one plus minus two to the power of n over n. Um, and usual with something that has a negative number to the power of n, it's often best to first uh, do a case distinction and have a look at um, the n values where that term here becomes positive and the n values where that term becomes negative, at least to get an idea of how that sequence behaves. 
You may not even need that for the proof, but it still might be a good idea to have a look at that. And in this case, um, if the n is an even number, then we'll get a sequence of a from two to the power of n over n. So that's for even n because minus something to an even power is plus that something. Uh, if the n is an odd number, then minus two to the power of n is negative. So we get one minus two to the power of n over n for odd n. Okay, so we also, we, we have this or this and those two alternate in the sequence. So basically we can look at those um, separately if we want to, and then see what happens. And well, of course, if we look at one plus two to the power of n over n, then obviously this term here, two to the n over n, the numerator is being doubled uh, with increasing n in each step while the denominator only um, increases by one with increasing n. So obviously that means this here is going to infinity. Um, of course I had an example in the lecture that basically shows that this is going to infinity. Um, meaning what happens here is well one plus infinity that of course still is infinity. So for n to infinity, this part would go to plus infinity. Similarly for this expression here, one minus two to the n over n. Again, that's the same expression that goes to infinity. This time we're subtracting it. So for infinite n, this is going to minus infinity. And that means um, this sequence here does not have a limit and it does not even tend to plus or minus infinity because it keeps jumping between those two extremes, right? So it increases for the even ends, it decreases for the odd ends, and it keeps doing so without having a limit in, in either direction. So obviously this Bn, this sequence here is not convergent and does not tend to plus or minus infinity. And of course, if I'm just asking for convergence and for a possible limit, then this first part here would have been enough. You don't have to uh, find out whether the, the, the sequence might converge or might tend to infinity or minus infinity um, if that's not explicitly asked for in the problem statement. Okay, questions about this one. Okay, so why do we only compute n to, that goes to plus infinity and not to minus infinity? Uh, because a sequence is defined as a mapping on the natural numbers on n, so there is no n to minus infinity. We're only interested in n to plus infinity. Can we just write down two to the power of n divided by n tends to infinity without a proof? Two to, so you mean like this one here? Yes, we've, we've shown that in the lecture. So of course you can refer to that and use that. Yes. Okay, so is there a way of seeing if something is going uh, infinity or is it just something you need to know? If something is going to infinity. Well, the definition of that is uh, a sequence is going to infinity if it increases past every constant. And of course you can try to prove that if you have a, a given sequence. Um, so given any constant, you need to prove that there is some n such that the sequence value surpasses that constant for every possible constant. Um, so that's the, the way of proving that a sequence would tend to infinity. You don't just have to know that, you can infer that. Of course, it helps to have some basic knowledge about easy sequences where we know that they tend to infinity. For example, this one here. But as I said, the proof that this tends to infinity is in the lecture. Um, why does it not tend to plus minus infinity? Is it that what we figured? So a sequence can only have one limit or tend to plus infinity if it goes um, 
further or higher than every possible constant, or it can tend to minus infinity if it goes lower than every possible constant. It cannot do both at the same time. Yeah, and this one here keeps jumping around, so it doesn't really decide whether it wants plus or minus infinity, and that means it does not converge to anything. Uh, so then the, there are like many questions related to the same thing, so I guess that was answered. Can we solve the question without making case distinction? Yes, you can solve the question without case distinctions. Uh, let me just demonstrate possible solution. So you could also say, um, we're going to look at the uh, absolute value of a sequence. And that, of course, can easily be seen to be, so if we have this expression here, then uh, we can already see that this one plus, that is not really necessary. So we can use triangle inequality and then just drop the one plus um, to arrive at this expression here. So this left one is surely greater or equal to this one here. Um, and as we take in the absolute value, the sign does not matter anymore. So the absolute value of this expression is obviously two to the power of n over n, which tends to infinity. So that means the sequence doesn't converge. I'm not really getting the information that it even jumps between plus and minus infinity. So it does not even tend to infinity. That's something I, I would not get from this solution here, but I would still get the fact that it does not converge. And that's the only question that is asked here in the problem statement. So that would be sufficient. Yeah, so then, um, but is it enough to show that there is a difference in the terms between even and odd numbers? Well, there might be a difference that is getting smaller. So in that case, maybe the thing would still converge. Uh, consider, for example, a sequence like minus n to the power of n over n, right? So there still is a difference in the positive and negative numbers, but the limit in both cases is the same. That, that thing tends to zero. So if you consider the limit, of course, uh, and that would be different than you're right, yeah? can consider the limit for even n and for odd n separately. And then if you can show that both limits um, are uh, maybe existent, but not equal to each other, then you have also shown that the sequence is divergent. We can solve such tasks by the stating that the numerator is increasing faster than the denominator. Well, just saying that the numerator is increasing faster than the denominator is usually not sufficient. Um, have a look at a sequence like this here. So in that case, the numerator increases twice as fast as the denominator, but still, of course, for n to infinity, that thing converges to two. So that is not alone. That alone is not sufficient. It might be a hint of where to look, um, but it's not sufficient for having a sequence tend to infinity. It has to be a lot faster, in other words. Okay, and last two questions. Can you also prove a sequence is unbounded by showing there exists an n for any value, no matter the size of the number? So I'm guessing what you cite here is the definition of unboundedness. So if you look that up in the lecture, that should hopefully be precisely what you mean. And last, as we have also discussed, alternating, alternating, uh, Wait a second, like. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so instead of, I know, I don't know what happened here. Okay, yes. I'll come back maybe yeah. in the next. Let's do the next part and then maybe you can get back to that if, uh, if you can figure out what uh, it means, the question. Okay, part C. Um, Here's a sequence Cn, uh, that involves square root. So we have a square root of n to the power of two plus three n and then minus n. And if you wanna compute a limit of a sequence like this, there's a neat little trick that you should know. Um, and that is what we wanna do is we want to basically get rid of that square root so that we can somehow combine these two parts in a reasonable way. 
problem here is, of course, that first part here for n to infinity that goes to infinity. That second part also goes to infinity. So we have something of the type infinity minus infinity, and that could be anything. So that doesn't really help. We somehow have to combine those two parts to get an idea of whether that thing converges and what the limit might be. And the trick is um, to simply, oops, to simply multiply this with an expression that helps us get rid of that square root here. Um, and what we do is we use the binomial formula. So we multiply with that same expression, but we replace the minus by a plus, like this here. Oops, three n plus n instead of minus n here. And of course we cannot just multiply by some arbitrary value. Uh, we have to divide by that same value so that um, actually what we do is we multiply by one. So we have to divide that whole expression by that orange term. I'm sorry, there's an N missing like this. Uh, so not to change anything. And what that does is, as I said, it helps us get rid of the square root because we can now apply the binomial formula. This is an expression of, of the kind a minus b times a plus b. And you know that this is a squared minus b squared. So we'll have square root of n squared plus three n squared minus n squared. And of course we have to keep the um, denominator. So the square root stays here in the denominator. But that's not that bad because what happens in the denominator, of course, is uh, this goes to infinity and this goes to infinity and we have a plus here. So infinity plus infinity surely also goes to infinity. So that's not troublesome anymore. Now what happens in the numerator? Well, if we square that square root, then of course we get n squared plus three, sorry, plus three n minus n squared divided by the square root of n squared plus three n plus n. And that means this n squared here cancels out. So we are left with three n over our square root expression. And now we're back at something that we can solve with methods that we've discussed before. Again, um, let's divide by the highest power of n. Here we have n to the power of one. Here we have n to the power of one. And here we have n to the power of two, but with a square root. So effectively that's also n to the power of one. So what we do is we divide by n to the power of one, or we multiply each numerator and denominator by one over n. What we get is three for the numerator and for the denominator, we have that square root. And of course, uh, we'd like to, let's write it in this way first. Um, so like this. And of course, we'd like to move this n here into the square root. So what we can do here is we can say, well, n is the same as the square root of n squared. So let's just write it in this way. And then we get three over, and we can now move all of that under one common square root. So we have the square root of n squared plus three n over n squared plus n over n is one. And so finally, what we get is the square root of, well, n squared over n squared is one, and three n over n squared is three over n plus one. Um, and now, as you can see, this expression here is three over n, that tends to zero as n goes to infinity. So as n goes to infinity, we're left with three, that's constant. And then the square root of one plus one, and the square root of one, of course, is one. So we get three over two. 
So again, that sequence converges and the limit is three over two. So questions about this one. Um, maybe um, quickly come to the questions that I couldn't find before. Uh, mm -hmm. Regard to point B. Yeah. Okay, so there are two. As we have also discussed alternating sequences in the lecture, could this also be written as a solution for part B? So yeah. and what would the solution be? Like the sequence is alternating and that tells us what? Not, not really anything to be true. So what, what it, I mean, in this case, the sequence is alternating and both parts are divergent and uh, if they tend to plus infinity and minus infinity, so it doesn't have to do anything with each other. Uh, but if you look at that here, for example, that's also a, an alternating sequence. So just writing alternating does not imply anything useful. It might still converge. So that's not a valid solution. And one more, instead of the mathematical triangle inequality, could we write that the one is irrelevant for large n so that it can be ignored as an explanation for the missing n in the... Well, if you, you could, if you are sure about that. I mean, it's only irrelevant if that here becomes very large. So you'd first have to discuss that point, right? If that becomes very small, then the one here would be um, the the part governing the limit. So that would not be irrelevant. But yes, if you argue that this here becomes arbitrarily large, then you could say, well, in the limit, this one plus doesn't really play any role. So let's forget about that. Okay, and now with respect to part C. Uh, okay, there is a question that it says, could you share some more exercises concerning this topic? As I think that this Especially here, a lot of practice is required. Well, we still have the homework. Yes, we have the homework and there should be quite some examples in the homework. Uh, also, by the way, I have uh, uploaded a few old exams just a few hours ago this morning. Um, and there are also problems of that kind in the exams, I think. So you can have a look at those as well. And uh, third point, you could look at the literature. Um, there's multiple exercise books in the literature that probably contain loads of problems like this one. Okay, and last question. What if we have n to the power of an odd number under the square root, how can we compute it then? So something like n to the power of three instead of n to the power of two, for example. Yeah, you could do it in the same way. Um, of course, the result might not be the same. It depends on what the other terms are. So in this case, what makes that so nice is that basically this n squared here under the square root and, and this one here, those will cancel out. Um, and of course that does not have to happen, but you could still use the same idea here. So even if this is not power two, you could still use the same trick um, and hope that it works out at the end. And of course you might get as a result that the, the sequence is not convergent or tends to infinity or minus infinity or something like that but uh, the trick still works. Okay, let's move on to uh, nine two then. So in nine two, um, we are discussing series. And let's start with part A. In part A, we, the series that we want to consider is given as the sum of from zero to infinity over one to the power of two K plus one plus minus one to the power of K over three K. Um, and by definition of a series, just to remind you of that, what we do is basically we define a sequence and we call SN the sequence of partial sums and that is defined as the sum from zero to n. And uh, discussing serious convergence is now the same thing as discussing convergence of this sequence of partial sums Sn. So you could of course apply anything you know about sequences to this Sn, especially um, that applies to the bounded and monotone theorem. So if you can prove that Sn is bounded in monotone, then you will have shown that a sequence converges. 
Um, I think there's an example of that in the homework. So if you want to practice that. Uh, in this case, basically what you can do with, with series, there's not a lot that, that you can apply here. Um, there's a few series that you know about and that you know the limit of. One of those is the geometric series, which converges. One is the harmonic series, which diverges. And we we'll later learn about the exponential series, which also converges. Um, basically, those are the ones that you should have at hand anytime. And the first thing that you will look at is if you have given a series and want to determine whether it converges, maybe it is one of those, or maybe it can easily be reformulated to be one of the series that you know already. Maybe plus minus a few constants, or maybe times constants, something like that. Um, that, of course, would be nice because it also gives you the limit. And in this case, that is what we work here. So what we can do is we can take that series here and try to reformulate it. And uh, one possibility to do this is, um, um, yeah, that, that I, I'll write it down first and then explain it in just a second. One possibility here is we could try to split that up. So we, here we have a sum of two elements. Why not consider these separately? Maybe that makes things a little easier. Uh, let's write a question mark about that because we cannot be sure about that yet. But uh, so what we can do here is write it this way and then as a separate sum, this second part here, like this. Um, why did I write a question mark here? Problem is, if I know that this and this converges, then I just have a sum of convergent sequences and that would mean the original sequence. This one here would also converge. Sum of convergent sequences converges and the limit is the sum of the individual limits. So basically this direction here, that would be fine. Yeah, that's okay. On the other hand, it could still happen that one of these, or maybe both, are not convergent. That will not tell me anything, however, about this sum here. For example, well, let's write that down first. Um, so if both are convergent, and by both I mean this one and this one, then that means the original is convergent. What you cannot do, however, is if one of those is not convergent or maybe both are not convergent, that doesn't tell you anything about the original. That might still be convergent or it might be divergent, right? So, but if the, let's say, split up version above, again, this one, is divergent, the original series might still be convergent. Very simple example, consider the series k from zero to infinity of zero. That is easily convergent with a limit of zero, right? But what if I split it up? I can split it up like this, for example. And neither of those two is convergent. They both diverge, but that doesn't tell me anything about this. So that doesn't help, right? Um, as I said, in the positive case, you're fine to do that. And if you find out that both of these converge, then you're good. If you find out that one of these does not converge, then please don't write, that means that the original series is not convergent. It could still be. It just means that you have, um, that you have used an approach that doesn't work here. Okay, so let's uh, continue with that computation because in this case, of course, it will turn out that this approach does work. So we're good. Um, so first thing here, you'll notice that this here, 
is almost a geometric series. A geometric series is a uh, sum over Q to the power of K. And we know that, let's write that down maybe. So something like that, Q to the power of K from zero to infinity. Uh, that converges if the absolute value of Q is strictly less than one. Um, and if that is the case, then we can use the formula that converges to one over one minus Q for absolute value of Q strictly less than one. That is a geometric series. And you can see this one is all, almost a geometric series. Um, the only disturbing thing is this plus one here, but it's easy to get rid of that because we can just write this here as, um, as one over two times one over two to the power of K, right? And then we take out that one over two and we're good. So this is one over two times the series from zero to infinity of one over two to the power of K. And now we have a geometric series with one over two being the Q of a geometric series. Same thing is true for the second expression. In this case, we have something like minus one over three to the power of K. So we don't even have to do any manipulations here, right? So our Q in this case is minus one over three. Note that this is negative, but it still has an absolute value that is less, strictly less than one, one third. So this also converges. The Q can be negative, that's totally fine. Now we can just use uh, the results that we know about a geometric series. And that means this converges to one over two times one over one minus one half. And the second sum converges to one over one minus minus one over three, like this. So what we get is one half times one over one half plus one over four over three. So altogether we have uh, one plus three over four or seven over four. So we know this converges and the limit is seven over four. And again, this works because both of these parts of our sum are convergent. Okay, questions on this one. Okay, so um, if we use the geometric series given as a sum of A times R to the power of K with R as the Q that was stated in the lecture, can we then compute the limit with the formula A divided by one minus R? Well, you just take take out the, the A basically, right? Yeah, so. Yeah. A, of course do that. a is equal to one, right? So. so in my case, A is simply equal to one. And of course you can take out, an, I mean, if you have an A here, right? You can just take that out. So we remove it here, we write it in front of the sum. And of course, then we just have it in front of that limit as well. Basically that's what we did here with the one over two. Okay, so now the next question is, um, how do I know which approach on solving the problem to take? Because in this case, I might lose a lot of time in the exam when the result is negative. Yeah, that's the problem with analysis. You don't ever know. <laughs> this is, I mean, but they will, I, I don't know if I can say it, but like, I think you guys will get like much more, um, I don't know, like intuition when training it with the homework problem. So this is a matter of training, I would say. Yeah, so, so to expand a little on my previous statement, um, basically in linear algebra, you almost always know from the problem statement which approach to take. In analysis, what you have is usually a large big bag of tricks. And one of those might work. And of course, if that is an exam problem, one of those will work. Um, 
and e you either just have to, you, well, basically you have to take a guess which one to try first. And if that doesn't work, then you'll try another one and maybe something will stick. Um, but as I said, said, you will get a lot of intuition. So if once you practice and uh, have a look at a few problems of different kinds, then you will develop some kind of intuition about which trick to try first. And in most cases, this will work. Um, but of course, there's no guarantee. Um, there might be a tricky problem statement that kind of tricks you into thinking that this approach might work while it doesn't and you have to try another one, yeah. As I said, that's kind of the problem with analysis. It's not, not always clear what approach to try. Yeah. Um, now I have to say there is a question I did not get. Is it wrong to write minus one times one third to the power of K? Then the result would be different. Really. Yeah, that would be different, of course. I mean, this this minus one is also taken to the power of k. Oh. So you cannot just factor out the minus. That wouldn't work. Yeah, because minus one, it will not always be minus one. Because if it is k equal to two, then it will become positive. Right. right. Yeah. So for the for the uh, even case, this will become one, and for the odd case, it will become minus one. So it's not always minus one. You can just factor that out. So that's wrong. What did you plug in for k that you obtain one divided by your q? Q, for example, one half. What did I plug in for k? So in this example here, I mean, k is, is the index of the sum here, right? So that needs to be the index, like here. This is the index and we have q to the power of k. And of course, in the limit, that index should vanish. So the limit is, is k free, so to say. Maybe I got the question wrong. In this case, please yeah, rephrase that. Yeah, maybe better. Uh, what about the series one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six? Does it converge to one? One plus two plus three plus so this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Does it converge to minus one divided by twelve, or does it diverge? It does. It diverges, obviously. I mean, it, this this becomes larger every step, right? So you start with one, then you have partial sum is three next. The next partial sum is three plus three, so six. Then you add four, so you get 10, then you get 15 and so on. So this grows by n in every step. And that means obviously that we tend to infinity. Maybe also rephrase it because I mean, it's like, does it convert to minus one divided by 12? I find it very specific number. Oh, how, how, how did you get that? limit here. I don't really, I can't really think what you were thinking here. Sorry. Me neither. This is why maybe. So maybe you could, you could add some explanation of how you arrived at that number. Maybe that would help. Um, but we can try to answer that later then. Yeah. Could you please explain how to get the one half in front? This one. So what I'm doing here is basically I'm, I'm taking this expression here and I'm factoring out a two in the denominator here. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm writing one over two to the power of k plus one as one over two times two to the power of k. And then I'm also writing one as one to the power of k. Yeah, that's obviously the same thing. So I'm factoring out the one over two here. And then I'm left with one over k, uh, one to the power of k and two to the power of k. So that's one over two to the power of k. And then if I have if I have that sum here, 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 then obviously I can just factor out constants of the sum. So I can just take this expression here, write it in front of the sum, like I did. So yeah, that's the same thing. And actually that's a very common trick with geometric sequences. Okay, I guess like why can't we take one half out of the sum is now answered and uh, why don't we take one third, minus one third in front? Because it doesn't help. Mm. I mean, in this case, uh, we could do that. But in this case, we already have a perfect geometric sequence. No need to alter that in any way. And no more questions. Okay, so let's move on to uh, part B, well, that's an interesting one, I hope, because that's another trick for your bag of tricks. 
So in this case, um, we have this, the sequence, uh, the series k equals one to infinity, one over k minus one over k plus two. Uh, now, if you just write out the first few uh, summons to get an idea of what's happening, maybe that will help here. So for k equals one, for example, we get one over one minus one over three. And for k equals two, we get one over two minus one over four. Then we get uh, one over three minus one over five and so on. So again, this here is k equals one, this here is k equals two, this here is k equals three. And of course that will continue indefinitely. Um, what you might be able to see here is, um, for example, if you take this one here, one minus one third, you'll see that a plus one third appears later on in that sum here. And if you think about that a little, the same thing will happen to almost all of those summons. If you take this minus one over four, for example, then a plus one over four would, would appear for the case k equals four. We don't, don't have that here, but it would appear here, right? So that would also cancel out. Basically all of these minus summons here would be canceled out by a later corresponding k value. You just move the k by two and you get a plus the same thing. Um, so that means the idea of this, um, of this series is here that most of those summons will eventually cancel out and only very few will be left. Um, and maybe that's just a finite number. So that would be the limit then. And to prove that in a concise way, what we do is we have a look at the partial sums. And this is one of the cases where we actually need to consider the partial sums. So let's see, we, we wanna look at the partial sum sequence that is SN, and that is defined as the sum up to N, not to infinity, but just up to N for some N. Right, and that, that sequence is in effect the series. So that converges and the series converges and its limit is that of the series. Okay, so how do we get to, uh, how do we get any, any useful information about that sequence SN? But what we can do is we can try to reformulate that a little and also split it up if that helps. So uh, the n for every sequence element, this n here is just a finite number. So basically you're free to do all operations. You're always operating on finite sums and everything will work. Yeah, no need to, to uh, worry about limits at that point. But, take the limit later on, but for now we're only working with finite sums. So we can freely split that up, for example. We can say, well, this is the sum from one to n over one over k minus the sum from one to n over one over k plus two. Right, and if we do that, then maybe the structure becomes a little clearer. So basically we have that sum with one over k and almost the same thing here. It's just that the denominator is a little higher, right? But almost all summons of this and this sum will appear in both with just a few exceptions. What we can do is we can try to reformulate that in a way that makes this a little more clear. Um, and we'll try to do that right now. So one possibility to would be to, to um, take this one over k plus two expression and try to reformulate that first sum so that it also uses a one over k plus two instead of one over k. Well, can we do that? We cannot just write one over k plus two, obviously, um, but we can do something similar. So here, for k equals one of the first denominator would be three. Here we start at one. So before we do that reformulation, we should make sure that the sum actually starts at one over three and not one over one. And of course we can simply do that by uh, separating the summons of that finite sum that we don't want in there. So what we do is we just take, so, sorry, we take one over one and one over two out of that sum as separate summons. 
And then we can just start at three instead of at one, one over k, right? So that was kind of the first step here. We just separate out the first two summons because we want to start at three. And now if we start at three, that means the summons that we have here are one over three, one over four, one over five, and so on. So we could rewrite that um, as having a fraction in the form one over k plus two instead of one over k. The change that we have to make here is, um, again, this needs to start from a denominator of three here and increase from there. And if the denominator is k plus two instead of two, uh, instead of k, then to make that start from three, we'll just have to make k start from one. And in this case, the last parts of that sum will be one over n minus one and one over n. In this case, if we sum up to n, then of course, um, we'll get one over k plus at one over n plus two as the last sum. We don't want that. We want our sum to, to end at one over n. So to make sure it does, we'll have to stop at n minus two and then k plus two effectively becomes n minus two plus two. So one over n will be the last sum here. Okay. So this is exactly the same sum, just written in a different way. Let me just copy the last one here. Now you can see we're almost done here. So we now have two sums that have the same type of summons. Both start at one. The only difference is one ends at n minus two and the other goes up to n. So again, we make a little modification so that both also have the same upper bound for the index. And this time we just leave the first one untouched here. So I just copy that. And for the second one, what we do is basically the same idea that we used before. Um, we just take out those summons that we don't want and write them separately. So in this case, we want the sum to end at n minus two instead of n. Um, so that means the summons for n minus one and for n have to be separated out. So these, these two summons here are then separated. And well, once we have that, let's collect the constant summons um, at the very beginning. So we have one, we have one over two, we have one over n minus one plus two. So that's n plus one. And we have one over n plus two. And then we have those two sums and now both limits look exactly the same. So both go from k equals one, two, n minus two. So we can write them again into one common sum. And that would mean we have one over k plus two minus one over k plus two. And now hopefully you can see what happens. Uh, this here is of course just zero. So we have a sum of zeros and that of course is zero. So we are left with one plus one over two plus one over n plus one plus one over n plus two. So that is a simplified term for the partial sums Sn. And by the way, I messed up with a sign. I'm I just see that, sorry. Uh, of course, as I have a minus here, this and this should also be a minus, obviously. So let's change that. So that's a minus, that's a minus. And of course, these are also minuses. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, and then it also a minus, yeah, right. Doesn't really matter. Okay, now what do we get uh, if we take the limit of those partial sums for n to infinity? That's the, the thing that we are ultimately interested in. Now what happens if n goes to infinity? Well, this here obviously goes to, in, to zero. 
this goes to zero and those two here are constants that don't involve an n, so those just say as they are. What we get is then just one plus one over two. So three over two. And that means this is going to be the limit of that series. So again, the series converges and the limit is now three over two. And by the way, this, uh, this technique here is known as a telescopic sum. So the idea is that uh, you have elements in that sum that are later canceled out. So basically most of the elements in the sum are canceled out. Some at the beginning are left, some at the end are left. And that's exactly what happens here. You can see that. So the beginning, and those are the ones at the end that are left. Um, so it's like a large telescope that you can just uh, Put, push together so that all the very small part remains, that's the telescopic sum. Uh, and that's where the name comes from. So in this case, this technique of telescopic sums um, will help. And of course, you can only apply this if you actually have a look at the partial sums. So that's why this concept is also important to compute um, limits of certain series. So let's see which questions you have about this. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that there is like an interesting YouTube video what it shows that the, the arithmetic sum that we had before, 1 plus 2 plus 3, it mm -hmm. kind of like gets to minus 1 divided by 12. I didn't have the time to see the video completely, but okay. I'll be interested. <laughs> Has someone posted the link to that one? Yeah, it's in the, in the, okay. in the chat of the... Uh, I'll definitely watch that later. Uh, okay, so now coming to this exercise, would, be, would it be sufficient to write the sum of the SM out, specified what cancels, and then compute the values that of what it doesn't cancel as a limit. So, like, so basically, that's what I did, right? You mean you did probably like to shorten the approach that I showed you here? Yeah, I guess. I guess, yeah, that of course is possible. Yeah, I mean, I I try to explain every basic step of that. You can, of course, just shorten that a little. Again, it should be clear what you're doing, of course, and it should be correct. But otherwise, uh, feel free to not do it in as much detail as I'm doing it here. Okay, then next question is, could it have been possible to extend one over K by K and one over K plus two and just add them together to have the limit? Uh, to extend one over K by K plus one and one so... over I'm sorry. So basically, what you want to do is, uh, sorry, minus one over k plus two. So you want to, uh, I'm guessing what you want to do is uh, you want to extend that in this way and in this way, right? So that you can put it on a common denominator. And then you'll have something like two over k, k plus two, right? Yeah. Um, so you have a series over these. I don't yet see how that would help actually. So I mean, I now I'm now I'm now left with something like this here. But how do I know that this or whether that converges and what the limit is? Yeah, kind of like it gets more complicated. Yeah. And you can of course try that, but I think it doesn't help to get the right result here. At least I, I wouldn't see how. Okay, next question is when working with partial sums, we can split them without worrying if convergence holds in both sides of the quality sign, right? You don't even have to care about convergence. So when working with partial sums, you always have a finite sum. You can do anything you want with finite sums. Yeah, no need to worry about limits because we're not talking limits at that point. We only start talking limits once we have that thing sufficiently simplified. So here, and there's nothing to worry about anymore in this expression. Do we need this formal proof or is it enough to plug in numbers like he did in the first step? Yes, you need that formal proof. It's not enough to just plug in numbers. That will help you get the idea. So if, if you don't have an idea yet, then of course I recommend you just plug in the first few numbers and then see what happens. Um, and hopefully that will give you an idea of what to do, but you will need the formal proof as a justification. Just plugging in some numbers is not sufficient. 
If the sum would have start at k equal to zero, like in the quiz, could you write that it's equally to one over zero plus one over one plus one over two plus sum of three to n and ignore one over zero? So I, I didn't start k at zero here, obviously, because one over zero is just not defined. So I couldn't do that. That's why we're starting at one. I don't know. I don't really know that was a question. In one of the quiz questions, it starts at zero. It shouldn't. So that is a mistake. Uh, if you discover a thing like that, so uh, a sum starting at zero and that it contains a term like one over k, that should not happen. Uh, if you discover that, it's surely a mistake. And um, I'd ask you to please write a quick message to the forum so that we can correct that. Or just drop me an email if you're not comfortable with writing to the forum. I'll forward that to our quiz master so they will correct that. Okay, and then it, it's a still another comment I get minus one over 12 from a proof which used Grandi series and analytic continuation just got me confused. Yeah, we can check that. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. If, if, if you have a link or the video posted, we'll check that. And um, we'll see where the catch is there, hopefully. Yeah, so there is another question, but there is like a, like a photo. So maybe this one, like we tried to, to answer it in the chat. No mm -hmm. more questions. Okay, good. So let's continue with uh, nine three then. One more on serious. Um, so nine three says for the following series, decide whether they converge or diverge. Give a justification for your answer. You will notice that it does not say anything about uh, a limit. So that might mean it might not be that easy to actually get the limit, or it might at least not be the intention. Um, if the problem statement asks for a limit as well, like um, like 9.2, I think, like 9.2 does, compute their limits if applicable, if applicable, sorry. Um, then that means you need to employ some method that actually yields a limit. For example, geometric sum will yield your limit. The telescopic sum approach here yields a limit. In 9.3, that's not necessary. So I would start digging into my bag of tricks um, and pulling out other methods first. That doesn't mean that the methods from 9.2 will not work. They might still be the ones that you have to apply. But the first thing I think about are others. Um, and if I don't want the limit, then one of the convergence criteria might be the right step here. And basically, there's uh, four criteria, I think, that you know. Um, there is, of course, the root test, there is the ratio test, there is the Leibniz criterion, and uh, there is the comparison test. And those are the fours that I would have in mind. Um, in this case, there's nothing like a minus one to the power of k, no alternating sequence. So you can um, probably exclude the Leibniz test right away. So that leaves us with three. Um, in part A here, we have a series that looks like this. We have one minus k plus two over four k plus two to the power of k. So each summand here is a power of k. And that of course is an indication that the root test might be a good first try. That does not mean it will work, but it's going to be easy to try that. And so that's what we're going to do first. So here we, we're going to try the root test. And if you're going to try the root or the ratio test, you should probably write down what the summons are that you're going to consider, just to make sure you get that right. Um, and also to give the correct hint of what you're trying to do and just in case you make a mistake in the next step. So it might not be obvious what your intention was. So in this case, the summons are, of course, just this, these expressions here to the power of k, right? So we're taking this whole expression that's an ak. And then this series is a sum over the ak's. So that's the summon sequence. Okay, please don't confuse those with the partial sums. That's something entirely different. 
So we try the root test. Um, what the root test does is it takes the kth root, the nth root, sorry, kth root of the absolute value of the kth summon, so like this here. Um, and then it tries to determine whether this is a number or bounded by a number that is strictly less than one. And the strictly is very important here. So in this case, the kth root is very easy to compute. That's why we wanted that test here. It's the absolute value of one minus k plus two over four k plus two. And that can easily be simplified. Um, again, we apply our standard trick of dividing by the highest power of k in that case. So we have one minus one plus two over k over four plus two over k. So as you can easily see, this two over k, that tends to zero, that two over k also tends to zero. So if we take in the limit of that expression, oh, sorry, k not, not n, k goes to infinity here, k goes to infinity, then that limit will be one minus one over four. So that limit is three over four. And that means at least for k's that are large enough, we can be sure that this is going to be bounded by a constant that is strictly less than one, right? So we, basically the uh, these kth roots of the absolute values of the AKs, so a sequence looking like this, tends to three quarters means as K is getting larger and larger, this is getting closer and closer to three over four. So it will not jump over one from a certain point on. And the small k's are just not interesting. We're only talking about the limit. So we can always leave out finitely many elements. That doesn't matter. Okay, so this is strictly less than one. And again, the strict is important. If it's equal to one, then that will mean the root test does not um, allow for a conclusion. So that means the root test is inconclusive. It could be divergent, it could be convergent. We just don't know. That means we pulled the wrong trick. We just have to try something else. In this case, we're strictly less than one. So that means the root test shows convergence here. Oops, sorry, convergence. So that means our series converges. Um, and once again, we cannot say anything about the limit with this method. So it's totally unclear what that limit may be. All we know is it exists, but that's the only thing that was asked in this problem statement. So we go with that. Question so far. So uh, the first question is why didn't he divide the one also by K? Doesn't work. I mean, doesn't help, right? It doesn't help. I mean, if I, uh, this one is basically one over one. And then if I divide everything by K, I have one over K over one over K. That's not very useful. Yeah, and then why do we also divide the two by K? Um, yeah, I wanted to write the formula, but maybe it's easier. So in this case, what, what I do is I divide, let's copy that expression here. Uh, copy that so that we can modify it. So this here is the, the expression that we're looking at. And what I'm doing is I'm dividing that whole fraction containing the case. I'm dividing that uh, by K for the numerator and the denominator. So I'm multiplying this by one over K and I'm multiplying this by one over K. And I always have to take the whole fraction here. Right? I, I cannot just single out one of the elements because what I do in effect is um, I multiply this whole thing by one over K over one over K, which is equal to one, right? So I multiply my fraction by one and I just write that one in a very peculiar manner that was helpful later. And that's why I have to divide the whole numerator and the whole denominator by K. 
And that one here, as I said, that's just a constant. That doesn't include anything um, of that kind. So I could, of course, multiply that by one and then write that one in a strange way, but it doesn't help. Okay, so the next question is, would we, would we be able to compute the limit? I wouldn't know how. I'm guessing you don't have an idea of either, Lissery. Yeah. I Actually, I don't have any idea what the limit may be. Sorry. <laughs> I guess we're not easily able to do that. No, I mean, we can try to kind of like get like a huge sum, like numerically, maybe MATLAB, and then see whether we see like any behavior. But yeah, yeah. Like fast and easy right now, I, I don't have a number. Yeah, at least I, let's say I wouldn't see a clear cut way of uh, getting that information. It's probably not easy. Um, so this also answered how could you proceed to find the limit? And then can you simplify the? 2 plus k divided by 4k plus 2 to k plus 1 divided by 4k. No. Or did I not get that right? So what are you trying to simplify? You're trying to simplify k plus 2 divided by 4k plus 2 to what? k plus 1 divided k by 4k. 4k. Uh, I have no idea what, what you did there. I don't know whether like if you are trying to subtract minus two in both cases, but then it's not k plus one and like- Well, became minus one then. Yeah. But uh, of course you cannot do that, not ever. Where's a red? I hear I have a red. I think red, don't do that. No, um, so for fractions you can multiply numerator and denominator by the same constant or by the same expression because that would just cancel out and give them times one. That's exactly what we did here, right? Uh, but you cannot subtract or, or add the same constant to numerator or denominator. That would not cancel out. So that's not an operation that is allowed. What you can do is you can add zero to the whole expression, but that's not useful here. At least I don't see how it would be useful. So no, please do not do that. Yeah, and then there is a question that it says, when we are letting k go to infinity, what are we computing then if it's not the limit? What we are com like checking is whether the series is convergent or not, but we do not have a limit. So what we're checking is uh, the limit of this expression here, not the series, but the kth root of the absolute values of the ak's, that, that is not the same as the limit of the series. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find out whether this expression is bounded for large k and whether that bound is strictly less than one. And that's what we do by computing the limit. So if the limit is strictly less than one, then of course, if k is large enough, then all these sequence elements will be close to three quarters. So we can be reasonably sure that this is bounded either by three quarters or maybe a little above three quarters, but still less strictly less than one. And by the way, that is why we need the strictness here, right? If, if that would be bounded by one, or if the limit would be one, it could still mean that some of the elements are a little above one and some are a little below one. So they might jump a little around that one. Um, but for strictly less than one, we can always find a bound that is still strictly less than one and higher than all the sequence elements, at least from a certain value of k on. So basically we're trying to establish that bound. That's what we do here. And it's not the same as the limit of the A case, uh, of the sum of the A case, sorry. That's a completely different thing. Uh, I miss one question that it says, do you get a point for identifying the right test? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I, I wouldn't say now, sorry. Depends on, uh, on a lot of things on how complicated it is to find the right test, for example, on whether we actually want the justification or just the result for that special partial problem here. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. It's always a good thing to write down the test that you intend to, to use, of course. You might get a credit. Like coming back to the point where like we said uh, the red part that we cannot simplify it from k plus one divided by four k plus two to, yeah. 
So there the, the question now is, isn't it two divided by two? No, it's not. So yeah, maybe, maybe no, like not. if you do two divided by two is that you are multiplying both sides of the ratio by two. And what you said before is that you are subtracting minus two in both cases and it's not the same. I'm not sure, it's really not easy to, to explain it. It's not right in no. it. No, but it's absolutely not the same. So again, what you may do is you may multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same number. Multiply, not subtract, not add, just multiply. Yeah. And that's it. Don't do anything else. It will probably be wrong. Do we only use those tests to show whether a sequence is divergent or convergent when we cannot or don't need to compute the limit? Can we just compute the limit and if it is a number, then it's convergent and if it tends to infinity, it's divergent? Yes, of course. So if you can compute the limit, you can always do that. And if the limit is finite, then you can know that the sequence, uh, the series is convergent. Yeah. So if the limit is easily computable, then that's probably the way to go. Then you don't have to use these tests and they might not even give you a good result. Right? So if, for example, if you have a more or less geometric sequence like we had in 92A, for example, I would just go this way, even if the question did not ask for the limit explicitly. Okay, last question. Can you circle the parts of your approach to the problem which can be classified as justification for your answer? Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have started that. <laughs> Let's see, uh, what do I need for an answer? Well, I would, I would like some statement of that form here. We want to do the root test and we're using these as um, the, the summons of the series. Then of course you would write down what the root test actually is. You would take that, compute that kth root here. Um, yeah, basically it's all. <laughs> You would then have to compute the limit and to compute the limit, you would need some justification. So that's the justification. That is the limit. Um, so you might need, might be able to skip that step here. And you, you will have to state that that limit is strictly less than one. And of course you'd have to draw some conclusion from that. And that conclusion would be the sequence converges. So there's not a lot you could leave out. Okay, so more questions now. Aren't we doing this test only for serious? Yes, we, we can only do this test for serious. So the ratio test, the root test, the Leibniz test, um, and also the comparison test, those only apply to serious. How can I see if a limit is easy to determine or if the task, well, this... The question is, is it easy for you to determine? And if you don't have any idea of how to determine it, then try something else. Yeah. Again, like this intuition will come with practice. Hopefully, um, yes. Uh, do programs like GeoGebra help with such tasks? Sorry, what was that? Like GeoGebra, like GeoGebra? I, I haven't. I don't know. I'm guessing they will apply some, some kind of tests like these ones. I don't have, uh, I, I didn't have a look at the source code of this. I don't know what they're really doing. Okay, and maybe now the last one, is it true that only if the corresponding sequences to a series has a limit equal to zero that the series is then convergent at all? So if the corresponding sequence has a limit equal to three, then the series will not be convergent. Did I, or did I misunderstand that? So what you're saying is, let me rephrase that. What you're saying is uh, if you have a series like this or some a case, and then you sum up, okay, let's say from zero to infinity or whatever. Um, and you're saying if that converges, then that also means um, these AKs as a sequence, so the summoned sequence will be convergent and specifically it will converge to zero. So that's something that's always true. Um, and of course that means if this is not true, if you look at that sequence of summons and that sequence does not converge or does not converge to zero, but to some other constant, then that also implies that the series can never converge. 
Yeah, so that's also one of the things that, that you should look at, oops, sorry, that you should look out for. If you have a sum of something and this something is not a, a series that converges to zero, then the series cannot converge. So that's a negative criterion, right? But on the other hand, it's not sufficient. So if that limit does, con does so if that, sorry, if that um, sequence AK does converge and if the limit is zero, that does not necessarily mean that series converges. And one famous counter example here is one over K, the harmonic series. Um, we know that this diverges, but of course um, this one over K does converge and it does converge to zero, right? So in this case, the summons do converge to zero, but still the series does not converge. That could happen. But if even this does not converge to zero, then the series doesn't have a chance of convergence. So that would also be something that you could use. Okay, let's go to part B then. So in part B, we, we will encounter the um, harmonic series that we've just discussed briefly. So here we have the series uh, from zero to infinity over one over four K plus one. And uh, hopefully with some intuition, what you'll see here is that this is almost a harmonic series. The differences are of course this plus one and this four. Um, the question is then, can you handle this? Can you modify that in a way that would yield the harmonic series without changing too much? And what we do is, um, formally, we're using the comparison test here. So with a k equals one over four k plus one, we again, we take those summons here. We have the following, we can state a k is one over four K, sorry, four K plus one. Um, and the thing that bugs us a little here is this plus one, yeah? But, but four is not a problem. If we had something like sum over four K, then we could just reformulate that to one over four times the sum over one over K. And that what we, would be, oops, sorry, we'd, we'd be good, right? So if that goes to infinity, then of course a quarter of infinity is still infinity. Um, but this plus one is a little troublesome and we get rid of that by using the comparison test. What we do is basically we say, if we can find um, another series that has summons that are lower than these here and still diverges, and of course, the one with the higher summons must also diverge. And uh, we can do that, for example, here by just saying, well, this is greater or equal to 4k plus k, because k, of course, is greater or equal to 1. And if we increase the denominator, which we do here, then we decrease the fraction, 1 over the denominator. And that's what we're doing. Right, so we have 4k plus k. Um, and the beauty of that is we can now write that as one over 5k. And that brings us almost precisely to this case here. All right, so we know that the sequence of the series over the ak's is then greater or equal to the series over one over 5k, k from one to infinity. And that is equal to one over five times the harmonic series. And that is infinity. So this diverges and of course a series that is even greater than that then also will diverge. Okay, so that allows us to draw this conclusion. That series is going to diverge. Um, the one point we have not quite addressed is originally, of course, that series starts at zero and not um, at one. But again, we don't really care about a finite number of summons. We can just take those out. So we can write this as a zero 
plus that series. And whatever a zero is, it's not going to be infinity or minus infinity. Um, so we can be reasonably sure that this is still going to infinity. Okay, so in this case, we use the comparison test to establish divergence. So let's see, here's diverges. Questions about this one? Okay, so the questions here are coming, if I have something to the power of a times k, can I ignore the a and do the root test for something to the power of k? Something to the power of, I maybe I did. Yeah, maybe like something to the power of a times k. So a times k is in the- Ah, so I have some, some q to the power of a times k like this here. Now you can do it without taking into consideration the a. Now what I could of course do is this is the same thing as q to the power of a to the power of k, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would just use this, this here as my a k, right? So then the, the kth root of the absolute value of a k um, would then be the absolute value of q to the power of a. So I could not just disregard that a, I would have to in integrate it into my computations, but it's not hard to do that. Okay, then would it be enough to state that the harmonic series is divergent or do we need to prove it in the exam? So you can use the fact that the harmonic series is divergent, but of course you would have to actually establish the comparison. So in this case here, for example, um, you would have to make this statement somewhere and then this statement here, and then stay, state somewhere where this is the harmonic series, so we can use this. Yeah, but you cannot just say, well, this looks like the harmonic series, so it, it will probably be divergent. That will earn you exactly zero credits. Okay, how do we know that k is bigger than one? Uh, we don't really know, we, we make an assumption here. So. Um, as you can see, k is starting at zero, so we don't know that k is bigger than one. It actually it is not for all summons. Um, what we do is we say that this statement here holds for k bigger than one, or at least one. And then we're saying, well, this does not really give us the result we want, but it does give us almost the same thing. It gives us the result for the sum that starts at one instead of at zero. And in the last step, this one here, we then care about this first summit. We just split that off and say, well, if that part already goes to zero, then something plus that part will surely go to, zero, uh, to infinity, sorry. If that part goes to infinity already, then that part plus something will surely also go to infinity, no matter what that something is. It's just, just a finite number, so it doesn't do anything for the convergence property. If the series was convergent, however, of course it would uh, it would change the limit, but it would not change the fact of convergence or divergence. If it is that obvious that it's almost the form of one over k, do we still have to use the comparison test or just say that it is almost like one over k, so it is it has the same limit and thus convergence? No, you still have to use the comparison test. What I want to test with problems like this is that you are actually able to correctly do the comparison test uh, and not just that you have the right intuition. Can't you just ignore the plus one in the denominator since it doesn't really affect the solution for k, equal to, uh, k tends to infinity? No, you can't just ignore that. Is it also possible to show divergence by applying null Folken criterion? Uh, no, I wouldn't know how. So of course, if if you can find out that, again, uh, we did that somewhere here, if you can find out this is not equal to zero, this limit is not zero, that's probably what you're referring to, um, then you have shown divergence, right? So using this criterion, it is possible to show divergence. It is not possible to show convergence. Even if that limit is zero, that does not mean that series converges. So this is only useful for showing divergence. But in this case, I don't think it will help. Um, okay, so how again did you get rid of the plus one? 
So basically I got rid of the plus one by this comparison here. I said, if I replace the one by a K, then this expression here is going to be greater or equal to this expression for almost all K, excluding the zero. And that means the fraction one over the expression is going to be less or equal to this. And that's how I got rid of the plus one, replace it by a plus K. And that of course has um, uh, the property that we can just contract those here. So 4K plus K is 5K. And then we're in basically in that case, we can just take out the one over five. That's the basic idea here. Can we use the partial sum to find the solution? You can try to use a partial sum. I haven't really tried, I have to say. Ah, uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So we still have one, one left. That should be quick. C94. So we're leaving series, we're back to a sequence convergence. And here we have a sequence that is defined as one over n plus the logarithm of n squared plus n plus one plus seven. Um, and basically that might be easier to solve using other ways than what I'm going to show you. It's just the idea is to demonstrate the application of the sandwich theorem here. So that's what we're going to do. Um, you remember the sandwich theorem, hopefully, if you have a sequence and then there are two other sequences, one that bounds it from below, one that bounds it from above, and those two converge to the same limit. And that means the sequence that you end below, that was sandwiched in between those two will also converge to that same limit. So in this case, we have that uh, sequence AN and we're trying to find bounds. We're trying to find a sequence BN and a sequence CN with this property here. And we're trying to find sequences that converge to the same limit. So if this converges to beta and this converges to gamma, then if beta equals gamma, then that means this AN will also converge to that same value. That is the sandwich theorem. Um, and often in that sandwich theorem, one of those two bounds here is just a constant sequence. And that's something that we can use here as well. So in this case, um, we can see that this expression in the logarithm n squared plus n plus one, that is greater or equal to one for all natural numbers. Um, and that means the logarithm is going to be non-negative. And that means that whole fraction here is going to be non-negative. So an is going to be greater or equal to zero for all n. And that's going to be our lower bound. So here we're going to use bn equals zero Right, that's going to be the lower bound. That's just a constant sequence. For the upper bound here, we have to put in a little more work, but not that much actually. So what we do for that is, uh, let's copy this A in here. So what we do here is um, we take a look at this denominator. Um, and you can easily see, again, as the logarithm is non-negative, n plus that logarithmic expression plus seven, that is surely going to be greater or equal to n, seven by one, right? The logarithm is greater or equal to zero and we can just skip the seven. So we're going to be greater or equal to n, even strictly greater if you want to. So that means the a n is going to be less or equal to one over n, right? So we decrease the denominator, that means the fraction will increase. And that's the upper bound. So that's going to be our c n here. This is going to be one over n. And that means we have established 
that zero is less or equal to a n is less or equal to one over n for all n. And of course, a constant sequence, the zero that will that will converge, that goes to zero. One over n, that goes also, also goes to zero for n to infinity. And that means we have um, sandwiched that a n between two conversion sequences with the same limit, zero. So we can conclude the limit of a n is also going to be zero. So that's an example for the application of the sandwich theorem. And as I said, of course, there are other solutions for this specific problem here as well, and you might find those easier. Um, the idea was just to demonstrate an application of the sandwich theorem. Okay, questions about this one? Okay, maybe first we can start by clarifying the concept. What exactly does partial sum mean? A partial sum, well, we, um, if you have a series, something like that, let's say we start at zero and go to infinity, then you can define a partial sum, or better yet, the nth partial sum, called Sn, would then be defined as the sum from zero to n. So you take the finite sum um, just up to the nth sum, and that is the nth partial sum. And these nth partial sums then will define a sequence. So that is the sequence of partial sums. Right? And if that sequence converges, then of course the series converges, right? The, the sequence of partial sums is exactly what the series formally is. Does that help? Then, um, sorry, like, could we just like, uh, wait a second. Can we also just divide nominator and denominator by N? Where? I think in that uh, C94 that we just talked about. So here, if you just uh, divide that by N, I wouldn't really see how that helps. I mean, of course you get one over N here, you get one here, seven over N, but what about that logarithmic term here? What's the logarithm divided by N? You'd have to compute that limit then. Yeah, I not really seen that. It doesn't really seem to simplify things. Uh, how did we get the first zero? The first zero, uh, so this one here, I'm um, guessing. Yeah, the VN, right. Yeah, so the statement is simply this, this term here for n in n, so and the n is a natural number, meaning this here is greater or equal to one, this here is greater or equal to one, so that whole thing is surely greater or equal to one. You could even make a stricter statement, but we don't need that. Um, and the logarithm is a function uh, that you hopefully know. So just a very quick sketch in case you don't. Um, and the logarithm is a function that looks like this, basically, and here's one. So that has a root at one. And that means if the argument of the logarithm is greater or equal to one, then the logarithm will be greater or equal to zero. And that's exactly what we do here. Um, and finally, if we look at the whole expression, we have a non-negative number plus a non-negative number plus seven. So that's also a non-negative number. And that's how we arrived at a n is greater or equal to zero. Okay, then the next one is, um, could you explain why the denominator is greater, greater or equal to n? So basically there are a few questions about the upper bound. The upper bound? That's yeah, right. like uh, how do we get that? Yeah. Yeah, so basically it's the same argument that we just made, right? So we just argued that the logarithm is greater or equal to zero. So what we do here is we have n plus something non-negative plus something non-negative. So that's surely going to be greater than. Again, you could even make that more strict, yeah? Because n is sufficient. You could say n plus seven even if you wanted to, but we don't need that. So basically we just 
leaving out these two parts of the sum and both parts are positive. So that will only, it will only decrease the sum if we, if we cancel those and only keep the first part. How could you have solved 9.4 differently? Which method would you have used comparison? Oh, well, I guess the easiest method will be to just look at the denominator, right? So if you have that here, the denominator is n plus the logarithm of n squared plus n plus one. And of course you'd again have to put some knowledge on the logarithm in. Um, specifically you'd have to know about the limit of the logarithm now. So in that case, if n goes to infinity, then of course this is going to infinity. This expression inside the logarithm is also going to infinity. No minus in there. And so it's a sum of positive numbers and that's the one thing that you need to put in now is the logarithm is then also going to infinity. So the limit of this expression here for n to infinity is infinity. Yeah, and that means one over that expression will tend to zero. Okay, so I'm not quite sure if I understood it correctly. If a limit of a k is not equal to zero, then the coordinate series is divergent, right? So if the limit of AK is not equal to zero, then that means this series here is divergent. Yes. Okay, but in 9.3a, we said that the limit of AK is somewhere near three fourths. And since this is smaller than one, the series is convergent according to the root. Hey, no, no, you got that wrong. I didn't say that. Uh, let's, let's go back. Um, it was A, right? So what I did say is, that the limit of the kth root of the absolute value of a k was three over four. I did not talk about the limit of a k. I talked about the kth root of the absolute value of the a k. So that's something entirely different. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, how do we know that n is greater or equal than one? We did not say n is equal. In nine nine four, I'm guessing. Yeah. So in nine four, it's it's in the problem statement. Uh, it says that the sequence. So we're looking at the sequence, a n, n like this. Right. Uh -huh. So that means the sequence indices are taken from that set. So that's in that case the natural numbers, and that of course means the indices are always greater equal to one. If you would include zero here, then that would be a statement like this. Would we verbally argue that the logarithm can't be negative with increasing n and so the denominator increases due to n? Sorry, I, I didn't, I missed the first part. Yeah, could we verbally argue that the logarithm can't be negative with increasing n and so the denominator increases due to n? Yeah, basically that's what I did or didn't, didn't I? So in this argument, I said, well, this is going to infinity and it's not negative. So the logarithm goes to infinity. So this all goes to infinity, right? So I, I don't really, I don't really see how you would abbreviate that or how a verbal argument would look like without mentioning these. Of course, if you mention all these facts, then that's fine. Yeah. How did we get an uh, how did we get a n is equal or less than one over n? Uh, again, what we did is we made the statement that the denominator is greater or equal to n by simply saying this is positive and this is positive. So if you just leave that out, then of course the sum will decrease at most. Um, so if the denominator of a fraction decreases and the fraction itself would increase, that means a n is less or equal to one over n. Yeah, so one over n, in this case, the denominator decreased, so that fraction is an increase over a n. That's how we got that. Yeah, so basically one half is 0 0.5 and one fourth is 0 0.25. So one half is bigger than one fourth, but two is bigger, uh, it's smaller than four like just an easy example, because there is yeah. a lot of question about the upper bound. Yeah, okay. So the last uh, um, question is, 
Can we just make the statement that if the denominator tends to infinity tends to zero without further proof? Uh, yes, that's fine. And for the exam, is calculator required to recommend it? Uh, neither. You won't need a calculator and uh, you won't be required. Won't be required. It's not recommended. I, I don't see a good point in using a calculator, actually. I'll make sure that all the numbers are easy enough to compute them in your head. And in my experience, people using a calculator often make unnecessary mistakes. You just mistype something and you take the result without thinking about it anymore. Um, let's say I have had bad experiences with this in the past. Yeah, or you just, instead of an exact result, you just take some rounded result uh, using decimals, like instead of one third, you write 0 0.3. And then of course, if you use that in the next step of the computations, then it's going to be off. So maybe what should cancel out will not cancel out anymore and you're getting something wrong. And of course this will be marked as wrong from the point on that you make this rounding error. So my recommendation is to not use a calculator. It will not be required. If you don't have one, don't get one. And then and there, practice, practice without one. Yeah, there is um, one organizatorial question. Uh, when will all the quizzes be open for exam preparation? So as far as I know, um, all the old quizzes have been integrated into the one that is called the big quiz. And uh, the upcoming um, quizzes will also be integrated, will be added to that one. So you can just use that. The old quizzes are all available as part of that big quiz. So in a way they, they are already open. And I think that's it. We do not have more questions. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So if any questions arise when you do the rest of that sheet, um, as always, you're welcome to attend our tutorials on Thursday or the Q&A sessions. Um, currently, the third round is on, um, and we'll open a second, uh, sorry, a fourth and last round of Q&A sessions. The registration will open sometime this week, so watch out for messages on the forum. I'll announce that then. And as usual, I hope I'll see you in uh, one of our exercise sessions, or of course, next Monday for our next central exercises. Goodbye and see you then.